Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Bishop Brian Willette of the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church coming to you live from the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains here on November 9th, 2016. Today we're going to be talking about the biggest news there is, and of course that includes the pre presidential election. I've got a co-host today, Deacon Thomas Moreland also of the Holy Nicolaian Catholic Church to uh, kind of discuss his views on this. So we're going to be doing two segments. This is the first two-segment show we've ever done. The first 45 minutes, we're going to be dealing with the presidential election. You are free to call into the show today at 802-321-0073. That's 802-321-0073. But before you start calling... Let us get the show under air because uh, segment two is going to be about the seal of confession. Deacon Thomas has some uh, news about uh, the law that was passed in Louisiana that's creating some controversy. And so we're going to talk about what the sacrament of reconciliation is all about and how the seal of confession applies. Should priests be mandatory reporters for child abuse? A lot of people think they should. We're going to discuss that and more today on Vestiges of Christianity. Stay tuned. Oh, thank you all for staying through the opening intro music for the show. Once again, this is Bishop Brian Willette. And, uh, you know, there's a lot going on today in the world. A uh, very controversial election that just took place. Perhaps one of the most uh, uh, profound, I would say, of uh, the uh, my lifetime anyway. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot to talk about, which is why we're doing actually a, a two-part, uh, two-segment show, back-to-back, uh, -back, so you don't have to wait for another day. Um, it's going to be happening as soon as this segment's over. We're going to do 45 minutes on this, and then the show will end, and then it will start up again. You'll have to click on the new link, so if you're following on Facebook or if you're uh, connecting through sp the Spreaker directly, uh, it's going to be two separate podcasts, but one show in two segments, okay? Uh, we've never done anything like that before. Another thing that we're doing new today, outside of uh, uh, the, the two segments, is we're going to be taking callers. So if you are interested in contributing to our discussion, um, feel free to call us at 802-321-0073. When I tell you, um, you know, we're using a Skype integration here, and I've never been a terrible fan of how that works. I really wish that Spreaker would come out with a, a switchboard s of option that is a lot more like what Blog Talk Radio offers, uh, but uh, Spreaker is a superior uh, service, so it's worth it to put up with the lack of a switchboard in order to be able to get the benefits um, of a cleaner broadcast. But Skype gives us problems, so there might be a little bit of a choppiness to uh, the callers. I'm hoping that we can clear that up, uh, but I will definitely listen to all of your uh, uh, feedback after the show airs. Tell me what you think about the integration. Hopefully the sound is good enough for it to work for us today. Um, and lastly, we're going to be having another th third thing that we're doing new today is we're going to have a, a a guest, uh, actually a co-host, Deacon Thomas Moreland, who uh, you have, have might remember, for those of you who listen to the Eye of the Seer show, he used to be a, a semi-regular guest on that show and would fill in for my co-host. Um, and so 
He's going to be with us today, and we might be doing this as a more regular uh, uh, feature to Vestiges of Christianity to make it a little bit more interesting, uh, particularly with this topic, uh, these topics today. So we're, today we're talking about first, in this first segment, the election results, uh, and then in the second uh, uh, segment we're going to talk about the uh, law that was passed in Louisiana on the Seal of Confession. Deacon Thomas will give us more information on that uh, when we get to that segment, but uh, to start off, we need to talk about the election results. Uh, it's been, uh, like I said, a very controversial uh, election, and uh, Deacon Thomas, for those of you who follow him on Facebook, you know that he has very strong views. He's maintained very strong views uh, all this time, um, and uh, we're going to kind of talk about what, what, how we look at this now, because I know there's a lot of people in America who are not happy with this result, but that was inevitable. That was going to happen regardless, regardless of how, uh, of, of who won. You know, which, however, whichever direction the election would have gone, it 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 would have caused a, a large group of people to be upset and a, a large group of people to be happy either way. Um, but clearly, I think, what we can see from the election results is that uh, uh, the world needs balance. And any time you throw into the dynamic an imbalance, a metaphysical imbalance, if you will, and fortunately on this show we can talk about those esoteric realities in addition to the fundamental mundane uh, results that take place, like what we see in presidential elections, you will note that any time you destabilize the system, the cosmic system for too long, it bounces back in completely the opposite direction. So if you don't like the results of this election, you probably should never have put into office uh, Barack Obama because he represented the initial imbalance that caused it to fall back into this direction. But we're going to be talking about that today. So let's go ahead and uh, bring uh, Deacon Thomas Moreland onto the show. Deacon, are you with us? Well, I'm here. Thank you for having me, Brian. I appreciate you uh, being with us. And you're still kind of, there's still a little bit of choppiness. I haven't quite worked that out. Uh, but, uh, you know, just like I said, talk closely to the mic and talk as, you know, loudly, like almost like as if you're having to talk to an auditorium and uh, project your voice. I think we'll get some good results that way. But uh, I can at least hear you clear enough. Hopefully the audience can too. Please, everyone, give me feedback on this. We've never done this integration before, and I'm really hoping for the best. Uh, there's not too much that I can do beyond what I'm currently doing to improve sound, but hopefully, um, you know, the integration will continue to work out for the duration of the show. So, Thomas, I, I know that, um, you know, you, it's no question that you, you know, were hoping for a Trump victory, which uh, you, you did receive, and, um, you know, certainly in the independent sacramental movement, uh, we have seen that a lot of progressive Christians... Uh, sort of gravitate to the ISM uh, because it gives them the freedom to express this alternative form of Christianity uh, that is very non-traditional in the sense that a lot of these groups promote non-traditional Christian values uh, like uh, gay marriage, uh, female bishops, things that uh, have never been endorsed by the canonical system, um, but nonetheless uh, are things that uh, people want. And so they go to the ISM in a lot of cases to promote their, uh, uh, their particular brand of Christianity and their own ideology. Um, but, you know, the reality of the issue is that it still comes back to, I think, a religion of me, what's important about what I want, what I want to get out of it, instead of yielding one's uh, authority to the respect of the church. So I would like to talk a lot about respect today. And I think I would be having this conversation regardless of who won. Um, we can demonize our opposition. And certainly I was absolutely no fan of Hillary Clinton. Uh, I, I 
think that, I mean, she's an admitted criminal. She has admitted to doing things that constitute a criminal act. So it's not like it's conjecture. You know, with Donald Trump, we have seen a lot of accusations thrown at him in the final weeks of his uh, campaign, which uh, I think was a very suspicious time to be coming forward with uh, accusations of events that apparently occurred uh, decades earlier, or at least a decade earlier. And, um, you know, I, I find that to be very inappropriate and suspicious. But the fact of the matter is, in this country, we are innocent until proven guilty. And I don't feel that the liberal side of the equation uh, gives respect or credence to that. Likewise, um, you know, so, well, as a result, Donald Trump was demonized by his opposition, uh, which gives it, uh, I, I guess, an aura of going into his presidency, almost as if we don't have to respect him now. And we're seeing that a lot with the progressive movement, aren't we? We're seeing where police officers don't need to be respected. In fact, because, oh, well, they, this guy's racist or this guy's, you know, shooting, uh, shooting at black people that are not... Uh, uh, you know, are not a threat or whatever people's perceptions are. And I'm not saying those things don't happen. I, I know that they do. And I know there's a lot of bad cops out there. But the fact of the matter is the, the, the opinion becomes we don't need to respect that person's office anymore because there's a few people that defile the office. Well, personally, I think Barack Obama, who had my respect as a president in his first term. Not that I endorsed him. I didn't. I, didn't I, I was not happy with his election. But I respected him out of the fact that he was the, now the president of the United States. And that office deserves respect. Just like the papacy. You might not like the Pope. And I know you're not a huge fan of Francis. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of, of Benedict. But the office deserves some level of respect. And you and I aren't even Roman Catholics. We're Nicolaian Catholics. So we aren't even obligated to give respect to the office of the papacy. But this church decides to anyway because there is a fundamental authority that exists within that office that needs to be respected, regardless of who holds it, regardless of if we agree with them, regardless if we feel that they're doing a great job or a horrible job. The fact is the office deserves respect. And so I feel like in this particular election, we've completely thrown that respect out the window. Part of it is because of this progressive uh, movement that, that has, has sort of demonized its opposition to the point of now, well, you don't have to respect police officers because they're all racist. Instead of seeing that, okay, there's a few bad seeds out there, you know, why don't we root them out and handle them under penalty of law instead of taking it upon our own hands to just hate cops for in general and show no respect to the office show no respect to the law that they represent same thing goes with the presidency so even if hillary clinton had won, which i think would have been honestly a travesty to this country not because i'm a huge donald trump supporter i'm not i respect him uh, because i have had uh, i have personal insight into donald trump uh that uh, gives me a little bit of a, of a better opinion of him as a person than i have of hillary clinton who as I said, is an admitted criminal, but not out, even outside of my personal feelings for these candidates, the fact of the matter is, even if Hillary Clinton had won, the office of the presidency still deserves respect. The process of democracy still deserves respect. And democracy will speak every time in this elect in, in an election. And I think it proves it. And you know, I, I, one of the things I was very critical about with Donald Trump was the the accusations of the of the system being rigged uh, i don 't like i didn 't like the implication because i don 't think it 's rigged I think it 's vulnerable to being rigged but i don 't think it is rigged but also from the other side of the coin, I would like to also mention that i don 't think Donald Trump was really talking about uh, you know, false ballads or, 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 you know, messing with computer systems, even though there 's a lot of social uh, media out there that was pushing this agenda. I think what Donald Trump was really talking about was how the media was rigged against him. Uh, how these accusations that were probably 
uh, fabricated within the Democratic uh, Party, um, you know, came out at convenient times to undercut him, to discredit him. And certainly we see with Hillary Clinton's entire campaign, it was based upon the hatred of Donald Trump. I'm not sure I got a whole lot of her policy in anything that she ever said. It was always in, re- in relation to how Donald Trump is unfit for office, even her commercials. Uh, we're all about showing how unfit he is instead of showing us how great she claims to be. And and so th- what this has done, all, all feelings aside, regardless of what you or our audience feels about the outcome of this election, I think it's important that we start talking about having respect for the office. You don't have to like a person to respect them. You don't have to have a personal uh, uh, admiration for a person to respect the office that they hold. And that's extremely important to remember. And so um, I'd like to start on that as a, as, a, as a launching point and kind of get your views as a, as a person who was a, a, a very strong a Trump supporter. How do you feel about, you know, I'm sure you're happy with the outcome of the election, but how do you feel about, um, you know, where we go from here as a country, as far as being a unified country, getting rid of the polarity that exists, because that's just going to continue to cripple government. And we're going to see uh, the opposite side of the same problem that happened over the last eight years with Barack Obama not being able to cooperate. But I think it's really important to note, and before I, you know, before I give it over to you, uh, Thomas, I'd like to say one last thing. I think it's a really, really important to note that Donald Trump spent most of his life as a Democrat. So I say that because I think, and I have some, again, personal insight into this this man, uh, I think he's uh, an excellent person to bring the parties together and start seeing that cooper- cooperative unity that makes government function. Because the United States of America is not a conservative country. The United States of America is not a liberal country. The United, St- the United States of America is made up of, of a cooperative agreement. And that's what's made it great. And that's why it's no longer great. And why Trump's entire campaign was make America great again. Why is it not great? Because nobody cooperates anymore. So um, I'd like to start from that point. So what are your thoughts on all this? Well, I agree 100% with you uh, when it comes to the respect for the presidential office. You know, we, we tend to forget that these people are human. We tend to forget that these people are like me and you. We, we, we put them on a pedestal. We... we, we Apply these concepts to them that are, you know, unreal. They're, they're, you know, they're, they, they, they we essentially make them gods, and and that, that's a problem in this country is that we, we lose sight of that simple human beings. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, President Obama, they're all human beings. He made this lot of policies, but at the end of the day, they go home, they go to sleep, they stop their families. You know, they enjoy watching TV. You know, it, it, it's we need to bring politics back down to a more personal level, more more humbling level. We we, we get, and I'm, I'm guilty of this because probably most everybody in this country during this time getting getting sucked into this this election cycle, which is unlike anything that I've ever experienced in my lifetime. And I, I doubt probably any election cycles did like this. You know, we get we get sucked into this theory this this you know it's it's either going to be you know my candidate wins or it's going to be the end of the world. And that that's really not what the way how it's going to work. You know, if Hillary Clinton won, it would have been it would have been bad, but it wouldn't have been the end of the world. It wouldn't have been the end of the United States. You know, we we. <laughs> We do have to respect the office of the presidency. Um, Barack Obama, for example, I think he's really, honestly, a nice guy. He's easy. You listen to him talk, you know, off camera. He's a very, very humble guy, very nice guy. I agree with almost every one of his policies, but I respect him that he was elected twice. You know, the people wanted him, you know, and we have to give Donald Trump an exact same respect. He was elected. You know, we can't, we can't, you know, I'm reading a lot of, a lot of things on social media where people are, you know, just, just outraged to, to, to no end on this, you know, that they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're, they're almost suicidal.
unfathomable to the point that you know they don't want to accept him as president, and it's become so polarized in this country that that we can't look at them as humans as I was saying and just see them as as people and give them a chance. You know, that's, that's all we have to do. We have to give them a chance, and whether they succeed or fail will be up to them. Yeah, I love what you just said. I mean, you're exactly right. I was in a discussion on Facebook uh, earlier this morning. In fact, uh, you know, my my uh, uh, wife had put out a post that uh, talked about you know the the respect for the office, not necessarily having to have respect for the individual or even like the individual, but to respect his office and the fact that he now represents it. He's no longer Donald Trump. He is now president of the United States. So you have to put aside and we would have had to do this even if Clinton, you know, had won. It could have gone either way. In fact, you know, if you believe the polls, if you believe what the media was pushing out there, uh, it seemed like it was going to be a clear victory for uh, Clinton. Of course, you know, um, fortunately, I, <laughs> I don't say this to pat myself on the back, but, um, you know, I do have a very deep relationship with the archetypes that govern uh, the mystical processes that exist within the world that really are in control, not not our egos and not our our our, our seemingly uh, powerful acts of volition that we believe we have so much free will and control over. But the reality of it is, at a metaphysical and esoteric level, um, the the human race is controlled by an archetypal system. And those archetypes really have far more power than we do over ourselves unless we learn how to cultivate uh, our own uh, uh, system that allows us to rise above uh, our ego structure, which is entirely 100% controlled by the archetypes that rule them. And so I have a pretty good understanding of this, I think. (laughs) Spent a lot of time, spent a lot of my life working with them. And uh, it was clear to me as, as far back as July, where I wrote an article on my Facebook page and I published it to all of our social media sites that Donald Trump uh, had the stronger archetype uh, that, and he was going to win. That that was the, the likely outcome. Now that doesn't mean it's definitive of course because uh, archetypes uh, do compete with each other. They do uh, battle each other out uh, in the Buddhist system that is considered to be almost like the demigod realm where uh, these very powerful systems are in conflict with each other and they're always trying to uh, get one up on the other. And so there's always an opportunity, of course, for the archetypal system to shift. But it's unlikely when you're dealing with an extremely powerful archetype that's battling an extremely weak archetype. And that's what I saw with Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Donald Trump was ruled by a very powerful archetype, whereas Hillary Clinton was under a very weak one. And so the chances of there being a reversal of the archetypal forces in that particular situation is unlikely. So I predicted a Trump presidency, and even though everyone said I was wrong, uh, everyone said that there's no way it was going to happen, and everyone you know, was saying, you know, the media was saying that it wasn't going to happen. I think even Newsweek had published a, you know, pr- a president uh, Hillary Clinton on the front cover. Uh, you know, there's all this kind of stuff going on on Facebook. I don't know how much of it was true, probably none of it. But, you know, it was still being pushed that she was going to be the winner. And so I kind of went into this election very cautiously. Um, I'm not a fan of her. It's not so much because of, you know, uh, her liberal progressive agenda, although I am not a personal fan of that. I'm a, I'm a political moderate. So, um, you know, I am definitely not an extreme conservative. I hate the Tea Party. I I hate everything that it represented. I'm so glad that Donald Trump really more or less demolished them because they needed to go. Um, and, you know, that's the funny thing about progressive liberals is they don't realize how much of a favor Donald Trump has done for them. Um, you know, because we're going to start seeing, hopefully, a government that can function because uh, I, I personally think Donald Trump is a political moderate, a lot like myself. He had to come under the, the, uh, the, the uh, in order to win, he had to come under one of the polar systems because you don't win as a libertarian, you don't win as a Green Party, you don't win as an independent, you win as a Democrat or a Republican. And uh, I think, but at the at the most at the at the most fundamental level, Donald Trump is a moderate, and so uh, that that I I respect greatly because it's it's political moderates who get things done. It's political moderation that that makes the world function. And so even though I have conservative leanings because of my religious um, uh, 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 foundation. 
uh, I see a lot of value in uh, what the Democratic Party promotes. Like, for example, health care. You know, I'm, I'm very much for a socialized health care. Uh, I've always been in, in favor of a health care system that, because I see health care as uh, an, an issue of, of national security. Um, for example, you know, when you take... Um, you know, if if we're going to worry about terrorism, if we're going to worry about war, and you know, countries that don't have our best interest at heart, and going out there and attacking us, which you know can and does happen, um, you know, and that's a big concern, and and everybody seems to be in agreement, Democrat or Republican, that it is the government's responsibility to protect its citizens from those threats. The biggest killer of Americans is not terrorism. The biggest killer of Americans is not war. The biggest killer of Americans is disease. And yet, we don't seem to feel any obligation to... As a, 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 you know, it, it, that the country would be responsible for protecting our citizens against these things. So I have always seen it as an issue of national security, and I guess that makes me a little bit liberal in that sense because I would like to see a health care that is free, um, and uh, I would like to see a a a uh, you know a health care that works at least better than the system we've got now. And honestly, you know, there are countries out there that have this and. And even though they're not perfect, they work a lot better than what we have right now. Because I am absolutely opposed to any kind of profit-taking on the sickness and death of people. I think it's reprehensible. And so that makes me, you know, a little bit on the liberal side in that respect. But on the other side of the coin, you know, um, I have no tolerance for abortion. And so I, you know, of course will favor a more conservative viewpoint on that. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately I'm about the stability of society, which I think is only achievable through moderation and not extremes. But I think sometimes you need extremes to balance out extremes. They kind of have to cancel each other out. It's sort of like fighting fire with fire. And so the cosmos understands this and the cosmos does this. So if you think, you know, if you think that anything less than the, than, the, than the fundamental laws of the cosmos were at work within this election, then you don't understand metaphysics at all. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, democracy is greater. The, elect, the, the, election, the electoral system is greater than any one of us and one, any one of our biases or paradigms that we throw into it. It still is is at the mercy of the cosmos, which makes the ultimate decision in the end. And right now we have had eight years of extremist liberal ideology infecting every area of life. We have seen uh, people who ab- conscientiously object to being involved in gay marriage uh, being forced to participate in this uh, like uh, bakers having to bake cakes, you know. I don't know about you, Thomas, but you know, when I go to Las Vegas, um, you know, if I were a card counter, which I'm not, but if I were, I would fully expect and understand that the casinos would ask me to leave, and they have every right to do so. They could say, you know what, we don't want your play. You need to leave. You need to step away from the table, and that's not racism. That's not discrimination. That's simply saying they have a right as a private company to deny me service. Um, And that should be a fundamental right to private companies. But apparently, when it involves uh, a a position like gay marriage, that doesn't apply. And then all of a sudden, now it's discrimination. And I mean, we have seen, you know, under these policies that have been perpetuated by the Obama administration, we have seen, you know, companies like these bakeries going out of business, being fined hundreds of thousands of dollars just because they refuse to bake a stupid cake. When there's plenty of bakers out there who will be more than happy to bake the cake, you have to pick on the one who doesn't want to do it, you know, and that's the kind of extremism that causes the destabilization of society that leads to the kind of ish thing that happened today on, on um, election day, or yesterday on election day. Uh, because those kinds of extremes will be answered cosmically by equally powerful extremes. But the thing that is different is that in its effort, in the cosmos's effort to balance itself back out, it actually will create an extremism 
that can self-neutralize. And so I see that in Donald Trump. I see him as being an excellent representative of both sides. It's just at this time, the, liberal can't, the liberals can't see it. Um, part of it is because most of them are young and inexperienced and, 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 and greatly immature. Um, the, a lot of the Hillary Clinton supporters are people who have uh, something to prove. So you see feminists involved in that. You see um, you know, people that have an agenda involved in that. Whereas the people who supported Donald Trump, I see as just people who are fed up with watching the quality of their country degenerate in favor of this new matrix. I have nothing at all against the progression of society in a carefully controlled, moderated way. Otherwise, we become stagnant. So if you had just pure extreme, um, I'm sorry, pure conservatism, We'd never improve. We'd, we'd, never, we'd never have any changes because the, the, the status quo would always be the same. It would always be maintained. And even when it's wrong, it would still continue to be wrong because it would be completely resistant to modification. And I don't see that. I would definitely see that in somebody like uh, uh, you know, some of the other candidates we had for the, the Republican Party that Donald Trump fortunately you know, beat out. But I don't see that in Donald Trump. Donald Trump is an opportunity. You don't have to like him. Uh, you don't have to think he's a great person. Um, you know, morally speaking, he's not the great, I mean, on a personal mor- morality level, he's not the greatest person. We all know he, he, you know, had <laughs> multiple relationships. And, uh, you know, I mean, I grew up watching Donald Trump. I lived near Donald Trump. I, I, I understand the man. Um, but that doesn't reflect upon his ability to manage a country. And we need to remember that. We need to keep that in mind. So, you know, in my, in my perspective on this, I see him as a great moderator. I see him as somebody who can bring balance back to the political system. Uh, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity that everybody has an obligation to give him as an American. If you call yourself an American, then have some respect for the uh, democracy that gives you the freedom to speak against it. Because there's very few systems in the world that allow that. I mean, look at, look at Europe. I mean, I know you, you, you've been following Europe for a while now. I've, I've, I've uh, watched you, uh, you know, following the politics of, of, of Europe. And, I mean, it's getting to a point out there where they don't have really a freedom of speech. They have some kind of uh, perceived notion of it, but they don't really have it in practice. They, you can't speak out against certain things without being accused of some kind of... Um, uh, 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 crimes, it's some kind of crime of discrimination. So, well, you know, what are your th- what are your thoughts on all that? Well, you know, you're, once again, you're, you're you're correct when it comes to to uh, Donald Trump. And, you know, you had Obama. You know, you know President Obama was was a hundred percent reaction to the neocon policies of George Bush. You had you had eight years of George Bush and and, and failed. Neoconservative policy. So the universe, the American people, got fed up with it. You know, and then the, the natural correction was to go the opposite direction. It went too far. It went too far with, with, with uh, President Obama. And we had the exact opposite. We had the extreme left wing government in pushing extreme progressive policies on the people. And Donald Trump, most people don't see it this way, but, you know, I'm glad you do, is that he isn't going to be that extreme right wing politician. He is going to be very, very, he does more as a, a, a classical libertarian, or not libertarian, but a classic liberal. He's, he's not going to be the extreme right wing reactionary guy that a lot of people will think. Yeah, I mean, people literally compare him to Hitler, who's fleeing. You know, they they excuse him a fascism, and, that, and that's utterly ridiculous. And it's not going to be anything close to that. You know, history history has always been a cycle. It, 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 you know, it, 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 everything that history does and that and how it happens is always a cycle. And I think Donald Trump is, as you said, the universe correcting itself in the right way this time and becoming more more modern. You know, Donald Trump has been a Democrat. And the fairly progressive guy most of his political career. 
you know, maybe with age, that change it doesn't happen sometimes. Maybe you just lean a little bit more to the right, but within archetypes that are working with him, I see it as a, he's a very, very centralist guy. He's a lot of the things that he said on the campaign trail are going to are going to disappear. They're not going to come to fruition at all. You know, he's he's going to be. He really is. If people give him the chance, that he's going to bring bring this country together more than 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 the last two presidents that we had. Uh, now, the key though is for this extreme left wing that we have in in this country now to give him a chance. You know, you I was looking at the exit polls last night for for on CNN. And in 18 to 33, the millennial age, they are hardly voted for for Clinton. And and then you look at the age gap after that, 40 or 33 to 65, I think was was for for Trump. Uh, it shows inexperience in our 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 political left here in this country is that that they don't they don't understand, unfortunately. Everything that is going on, they 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 go off of emotion, they go off of of of, of feelings, and that's not what or how we should vote. We need, you know, to, to to be realistic. You may not like the guy personally. Is Donald Trump moral? Far from it. You know, and and, and and like you said, you know, he's actually kind of good for for the left wing. He's he's a he's a very secular guy. You know, he's he's got about as much religion in him as I, I don't know why. He's not a religious guy. <laughs> you know, he, he's an extremely secular individual, and that, that should be promising to the left because they're obviously secular. Uh, there's a lot of good that the left can see in him, but they're so 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 polarized and so hurt right now that they're they're unable to do that or they're unwilling to do that. And that's that's what's going to hurt this country in the future. Yeah, I agree completely. I think that, and I said that in my prediction back in July, that initially, you know, a Donald Trump presidency was is going to um, sort of create uh, a, a period of, of global disorder, whether it be as simple as just, uh, you know, uh, negative effects within the markets or something far more extreme. Uh, in the terms of you know social unrest, we definitely saw some uh, riots in California over this. Uh, but then again, California, uh, particularly L.A., seems to riot uh, just because the sun rose in the east. <laughs> you know, I mean, they just they just find excuses to riot and loot out there, and uh, it doesn't take much. So that's not terribly surprising. But I think if people give an opportunity to let Donald Trump be our president, whether you like him or not. And like I said, I am not a, I'm not a, a, a 100%, you know, great fan. I've seen some people out there that love him, you know, and uh, I don't see any reason why you shouldn't like him. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I kind of treat people uh, on equal ground. And so I don't terribly love anyone as, any more than I terribly hate anyone uh it's just part of the, the the system that we deal with so we have to look at the archetype we have to look at the power of the archetype and the president of the united states is one of the more powerful archetypes that uh human beings will contend with in uh in their life on this planet and so there's some respect that is due there and I think if you give opportunity uh, to, uh, or if you give that archetype the respect that it's due, it will reward you. It, re it will reward everyone. It doesn't even matter, ultimately. Um, but uh, we're now at the end of segment one, and uh, we're getting ready here now to shift topics away from the election and start talking about the sacrament of reconciliation. Um, I think you're going to find that uh, there is a, a tremendous uh, confusion. Uh, and D Deacon Thomas brought this to my attention last week. And we talked about doing a show about this because, uh, you know, 
it needs to be addressed. People need to understand what the seal of confession is, why it's important, why Louisiana passed the law that it is. If you don't know what law that is, Deacon Thomas is going to share that with you uh, when we come back from a one-minute break here. So we're going to now uh, break for segment one, and you will have to uh, re-click to, to listen to segment two because it's going to actually be uh, separated uh, by two different podcasts. That's just the way it has to work here on Spreaker. I didn't make the rules. <laughs> Don't blame me. I wish it could be a little bit more simple. Um, so we're going to take a break here. We'll be back in just a moment with segment two, the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Stay tuned, everyone. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 